clear skies. Who wants to look at that? Let's take a look at something different. You might recognize this from the closing clips. I sometimes get some questions about where this is. This is Lake of the Pines in Northeast Texas. I took that footage coming back from an AOPA convention. I was invited out there to give a talk in June of 2018, and I snapped that on the way home. Anyway, let's take a look at the surface map. This afternoon, we have a strong frontal system moving into the eastern U.S., stretching from Vermont through western Virginia and into the Atlanta area. Trailing that, pretty strong line of storms and showers. And then we go further back and we get into some of the cooler air. Not very cold, but once you get to the Great Lakes, we pick up 60s and 50s up in Ontario. The trailing edge of that front runs from about El Dorado, Arkansas, up to Dodge City and to about Scotts Bluff. South of that, there are northwest winds, but this does look to be in the tropical air mass. As we go further south, we get into some of the better moisture. Mid 60s to upper 60s dew points. And I've noticed that our air conditioner is running a lot better. So it's not having to work to get all that moisture out of the air. And down to the south, hundreds starting to show up in southwest Texas. Further out in the southwestern U.S., hundreds. Not really a big surprise there. And the heat low and the associated trough running from the Mojave Desert up into the Pasco and Spokane area where it's in the upper 80s. Taking a look off the east coast, we've got Hurricane Larry, 95 knots there, slowly weakening as it moves to the north. Off the coast of western Mexico, we've got Tropical Storm Olaf, only 40 knots on that, Last week, we had Nora coming up through the Gulf of California and up to Arizona. This one has taken a track a little bit further to the northwest. Checking in on the Pacific, Alaska, Western Canada. Alaska is still between systems, and it's still running pretty cold there. Lots of 40s and 50s. Looks like about uh, maybe 52 for Fairbanks, right in that area there. I don't think it's all the way over here. I think it's more like right there. And... Anchorage right around 53. Yeah, that's pretty cool for this time of year. A little bit of ridging down in the Gulf of Alaska, but you go a little bit further west. A strong frontal system just south of the Aleutians. And here's the picture for eastern Canada. The big thing that I'm seeing here, the concentric thickness lines indicating that there's a strong cold air mass over the Labrador Sea in this area. You can see some snow showers and temperatures in the low to mid 30s. Further to the south, there's the northern stream frontal system and a little bit of snow coming down near Cambridge Bay. So circling back to the U.S., let's take a look at these showers and thunderstorms in the Appalachians. SPC, always a good place to start. Well, we've got a slight risk running from about Burlington, Vermont, down through the Hudson River Valley, around Schenectady, Albany, and down towards Washington, D.C. No watch boxes on that. And the severe storm reports just indicate a little bit of wind damage in central Pennsylvania and further to the south with the storms out ahead of the line in the Chesapeake Bay region. There's a look at some of that stuff on the College DuPage radar. Atlanta down here in the corner and Huntsville, I think that's right about there in Nashville up here. A lot of stuff out ahead of the line. This is more tropical in nature. And as we get further north, this picks up the line in the Appalachians. There's a quick animation on that. It does look like the stuff up north in Tennessee is somewhat moisture starved. There's a quick look at the Charleston radar. This indicates that there probably is extensive lift, but not very much instability. And due to the fast motion on those cells, there are some strong winds aloft. Let's take a look further up the line. 
yeah, these cells definitely look a little bit stronger. This is central Pennsylvania, and that cell there looks particularly interesting. It's kind of out ahead of the line, and it's probably got good access to moisture and high theta E's. And here's the Albany radar, definitely some stronger storms. And some of these elements look to be kind of trying to bow out ahead of the line. That cell there is ahead of the line. So certainly some isolated severe weather potential within that. And I would imagine this would be capable of some wind and small hail. And we don't often look at the Vermont radar, but uh, that's Burlington and Quebec right up here. So there is some weakening of the cells as you go further north, and very likely the theta E's up there are not conducive to severe weather. Anyway, a couple of interesting cells. That one right there, see that? Got kind of a kidney bean shape. So if I was looking at the radar, I would pay close attention to that. And further down the line, a couple of other strong cells. So it could be kind of an active afternoon in Vermont. Now a good place to start to kind of do a quick mesoanalysis, go to Pivotal Weather and start looking at the products. Well, in this, this is a temperature plot for, well, it's 18Z, that's a couple hours ago, but we can bring that up, about two hours, let's do that. Yeah, that's about the current time right there. And we can see 80s all the way from the Montreal area down the Appalachian, so the air mass looks to be somewhat similar until you, you get up into Quebec. Now, what does that mean for convection? Let's take a look at the theta E's. That's over here on the left. We click on that, and we can see that the better parcels are down to the south, especially in southeastern Pennsylvania, and another little tongue up there around Kingston, New York, Binghamton, and then it kind of tapers off as you go north. But obviously, we do have strong storms in this area right here, so very likely there's stronger forcing and possibly colder upper-level conditions as you go north. We can take a look at some parcels by clicking. I put that right in the tongue of the best theta E, and that gives us a look at the moisture profile. Now, it does taper with height. That can be certainly a negative because that means you're bring in drier and drier air down to the surface as this layer mixes. So that 68 degree dew point is not really realized. This is more like a 62, 63 dew point after mixing. The mid and upper level temperatures are a little bit warm, certainly not cold and that's not conducive to very high capes, but it still looks like we're squeaking out on the mixed layer method. Well, about 600. I don't know about these most unstable methods. Those tend to be a little bit too optimistic. So I prefer to go somewhere in between that. So I, I would call this probably 1000s capes. And yeah, that little warm layer between 500 and 700 is reducing that cape somewhat. And the wind profile, not great. We've got 55 knots up there at 250 millibars, and it's somewhat unidirectional. It's all coming from the same direction. And that gives us kind of a straight line hodograph. Now, the storm is placed off of the hodograph. That's the right mover. But the zero through one kilometer shear is not that great. So the triangle between the storm motion vector and zero through one Kilometer is not that strong, kind of a very thin sliver, and consequently that gives us kind of a low SRH in the 50s right there. So not great setup for severe weather, but we've certainly got the instability. We've certainly got some zero through one, zero through, I should say surface through six kilometer shear, and the LCL Basically, the RH, the, the separation between the moisture and dew point, is kind of close. So that means higher relative humidity, and that can be a favorable aspect if you get tornadic storms forming. But I'm not sure we're going to be seeing that on a widespread basis today. 
But in terms of how that looks, there's the LCL sitting around one kilometer, which is favorable for tornadoes if supercells get going. And that is just one sample. If you look at only one sample, you're going to kind of be affected by noise there. There's going to be some bias. So you need to be looking at multiple scooties and just kind of sample the environment around the area. Now, if you want a very quick solution, you can go to the severe weather tab. Let me move that over a little bit. Yeah, there we go. You can go straight to the supercell composite. That kind of sums up all the best ingredients. So Philadelphia and whatever's in here, Harrisburg. And then on up into New York, those are some good areas for uh, severe weather. And there's that severe weather on visible satellite. Well, we can't really see the severe weather, but we can see overshooting tops and strong updrafts, like right here. That would be a very important area to look at. That's a overshooting top. You can see a bit of shadowing on that and other strong updrafts throughout this area. So if you don't have radar, you can fall back on this satellite imagery. And you can see that these cells look quite impressive. They look discreet. One, two, maybe two and a half, and three. And that discreet appearance is very important for severe weather production because that means you have cells that are dominant in the environment. They can kind of develop and not have to compete with other cells right adjacent to them. You don't have seeding as much of a problem. And when things really get cranking like this, you also have to keep an eye out ahead of the line. Sometimes you'll have a cell get going out in that region, and those do tend to be more isolated. And that means that if they do develop, you could be in some real trouble. You contrast that with further south in West Virginia, you can see these cells look a lot more mushy, not producing those rock-like anvils that we have in New York. A couple good cells here and there, but nothing like what we have up north. Here's a quick look at what we're expecting in terms of records today. These are official Weather Service forecast highs. Expecting 106 at Sacramento, breaking a record from 57, 1957, by 4 degrees. A lot of records across central Nevada so there's no question where that heat wave and the upper level high is centered. 98 at Winslow, also breaking a record for the date. And in the southwest deserts, very hot. However, we're not expecting any records to be broken. Similar story in South Texas. 98 at Austin, 101 at Del Rio, but no records being broken for the date. So there is something notable about this week. This is the time of year when the ocean basins in the northern hemisphere reached their warmest temperatures. So we're at the peak season for generating tropical cyclones. And after this week, it's kind of a very gradual decline as things start cooling down a little bit and things taper off quite a bit in October. Anyway, this just got named, I think, in the past hour, Tropical Storm Mindy. That was a tropical depression. Now it's making landfall there, 40 knots on that, 35 knots on that. And Larry, 95 knots, moving to the north-northwest. And you can see that on that image graphic, bypassing Bermuda, so good news for them, and gradually transitioning off from a hurricane into an extratropical storm as it passes Newfoundland. There could be some impacts around St. John's on Friday night. That would be an interesting place to be. And then we find it in Greenland by Sunday. Anybody want to chase up there? Tropical Storm Mindy, there it is, moving across Florida and weakening into a tropical depression southeast of Savannah. Yeah, and that appears to be the first update. It has just been named. So I'm glad we were able to catch that. Let's take a whirlwind tour of the upper level charts. This time of year, I like to look at the 500 millibar chart. You can see that 594 decameter 
pipeline centered on Utah. That's outlining pretty perfectly some of the hottest weather. Well, I guess some of it extends off to the west in that ridge right there. But you can see right, right in the center there, there's some very warm temperatures. This is a classic warm core high. And those temperatures in the center, 18,000 feet, they look to be about minus 3 Celsius, which is actually pretty warm this time of year. We move that forward. You can see that high moving off into the Four Corners area by Thursday, and then into the Texas Panhandle very gradually by Saturday and Sunday. So it kind of flattens out into this oblong shape. And south of that, we start getting this easterly flow developing across Texas, very common this time of year. So it's kind of weird that if you are flying from Atlanta to Dallas, you would have a tailwind. And that also means that with the temperatures being a little bit cooler along the Gulf, there's more likely to be some storm activity down in that area. So moving into the following week, Still got a ridge centered across Texas, east-west, that oblong subtropical high, kind of extending like that. Away from that ridge, some prospects for a precip. Underneath, not very likely. You'd have to get a good buildup of low-level moisture and maybe a front to kind of shake things up. And it finally looks like that pattern breaks up by midweek next week. Upper level high right there over Georgia, so it's going to be hot in that region. Upper level high in the Las Vegas area, but in between, some weakening of that high, so that's good news for Texas in terms of precip. And then the prevailing westerlies really get going. Look at that, some very strong jet stream activity along the northern tier states around mid-month. And we get this little cutoff low drifting aimlessly around the Midwest, so could be some storms and showers associated with that late next week. And that will be a good stomping point. I want to thank our new Patreon supporters, Hank Dolan and Ryan Melberg from last week. Thank you all for contributing to the program. And thanks to all of our other patrons, such as Stephen Kondrak, James Taylor, Stephen Dorsett, and Brian Nelson, people like you help keep this program going. We'll be back on Friday. Hope to see you then. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.